I V M. My guest today is someone who I now know for over fifteen years. She is armed with a double masters in physics, a PhD in electrical engineering. She was working for the U.S. Navy for several years on many secret projects. She's been on every fleet ship except a submarine. But what happened one day was she decided to leave this all and take up meditation and yoga. And uh, here we had a, a warrior who has now become a meditator. Her quest now is something very unique where she's looking to help both adults and kids take up meditation and also marry that with her own passion for teaching uh, math. So welcome to my show, Jasleen. Uh, really you. excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Another fact which everybody should know is that apart from uh, I knowing her for a long time, she's also my sister-in-law. So we have a double relationship. <laughs> yes, that's correct. And um, you know what? You know, when I was trying to figure out all the guests on my show, uh, your story has been one of the most fascinating stories. And I thought that I must get you on because... What you have done is truly remarkable and uh, it has so many contrasts because at one end you are this, uh, you know, rocket scientist, PhD <laughs> in engineering uh, with, you know, working for the Navy and doing all these things. And the other aspect, you are a bhakt of uh, art of living and you do meditation and you're trying <laughs> to m make the world a better and peaceful place. Yeah. Um, so there yeah. is this this extreme <clears throat> contrast in your personality. So I thought it'll be interesting mm. to explore your journey. Yeah. So so tell me what took you to America way back in 1990. So I would say that I did not go to America in 1990. I think the seed of wanting to go to America came in me when I was 15. 15. 15. That's what I'm told by my family that even at such a young age, I knew that I wanted to go to the U.S. or America and um, get my Ph.D. At the age of 15, at you were dreaming of, of doing a Ph.D.? That is correct. At the age of 15. What kind of 15-year-old are you, right? I mean, 15-year-olds <laughs> are like thinking of, you know, food, travel, girlfriends, boyfriends. No. Uh, and you are already thinking of Ph.D. in America. I mean, I, most 15-year-olds at that time could not even locate America on a map. Yeah. So I think my love for mathematics dawned in me in eighth grade by my uh, math teacher, Mr. Murlithar. And uh, I enjoyed doing math so much that it was very natural for me to become very good at physics. And I, those were my favorite subjects. In fact, everybody would tease me in the family. We would go on a family vacation. Summer vacations were typically in Punjab. And we would take a train ride all the way to Punjab. And the books that I would pack with me would be books on math or physics. Math and physics. That's what I did in, over the summer holidays. Wow. Very geeky. Um, well, the only thing I remember in physics is Newton's law. That is that everything <laughs> has an equal and opposite reaction and that's it. Oh, but that is, that's interesting because that's how our life is. Our life is full of dichotomy. You know, uh, one very important lesson that I learned when I did the art of, since you brought up art of living, opposite values are complementary. So, but we don't want to talk about art of living now. We still want to figure out <laughs> okay. what took you to America and why were you dreaming of America at the age of 15? I have no idea. I, maybe I saw it in a movie or something. Which I don't movie know. had I people going no to America when they were 15? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I just know that it was something that drive developed in me at a very young age. And um, I was reminded of that when I made it happen in 1990. So all the way from that point, everything that I did, I did with this focus of mind. In fact, I don't know if Vishal, if you know this about me, um, you know, I paid for my own airplane ticket to America well, as I, a student. 
Mm -hmm. I worked hard every job that I took. And I did a lot of tutoring jobs while I was uh, a student. But before you did your PhD, you did two masters. How, I mean, I could barely complete one. I mean, I could not <laughs> even complete one BCom. And you have done not one, but two masters. So that also, again, was for my goal to do my PhD. When I got admission in the university, I was going to go to University of Wyoming in the Laramie. And... Uh, when my father found out that I have the admission and I want to go, he said, no, you're not going to go. I said, what, what do you mean I'm not going to go? I have an admission. I, the I-20 is on its way. He said, if you really, really want to go to U.S. Now, mind you, I'm 22 years old. At that time, fathers, parents think of getting their daughters married. At 18. <laughs> yeah, okay. I was 22. I was late, right? So his thing was that, okay, if you really want to go, you are going to Dayton, Ohio. That's it. I was only given the option. Only to one to, city. Only one city in America. And why is that? Because my mama's son lived there. Oh. So I was given permission to go to America as long as I lived with my cousin. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the blackboard and I started looking at the universities. I couldn't afford to go to University of Dayton that had the PhD program because it was a private school and there's absolutely no way I would have secured a financial aid or a scholarship as an international student. I had done my research. So the only option that I had was Wright State University in Dayton. And how did you do research? There was no internet that time, right? Yeah. So oh how were researchers done? I think I became a permanent visitor of the U.S. Consulate Library or something like that. I went there. Any library that had information about universities in the U.S., I was there. I did a lot of research. Just I did a lot of footwork. And, and in today's, all these kids of today who are having internet and everything are still confused on what to do. I think maybe because they have too many choices, okay. you know. So confusion due to too So many you choices. went to the library and researched All which that. courses you have to do. All that, yes. Wow. And then uh, Wright State was a good option, but they did not have a PhD program. They had only had a master's program. And uh, since I was single focused and I was set that I wanted to do a PhD, uh, and I really wanted to do a PhD in physics. I just happen to do... I mean, they're very rare when people are so focused that I only want to do this and I only want to do this subject. So that's actually not very surprising for me right now, Vishal, because my daughter, she's 16 years old. And since she was in fourth or fifth grade, how old you are you? And fourth, like 10, eight, nine, 10 years old. Since then, she's single focused that she wants to become a veterinarian. So it's not very... I don't think there's anything special about me that I was so single focused. So, but veterinarian is different than but doing PhD in physics. <laughs> I mean, maybe you want to create a nuclear bomb. That could have been like, a, you know, like yeah. PhD in physics, se kya hota hai, right? I mean, you become yeah. a doctor, you become an engineer. Yeah. What does a PhD in physics do except making nuclear bombs? Uh, so I think physics, because... When I was studying quantum mechanics in my bachelor's, oh God, you studied I loved quantum it. mechanics. Oh my also. God! Don't get me started about quantum mechanics. You also I studied love... quantum physics. Yes. Quantum what is the difference between yeah. quantum physics and quantum mechanics? <laughs> Do two masters, you'll figure it out. No, no. <laughs> I I want to find the hack. What is the difference? Like, tell me right now. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing about physics is it's so logical and so simple, but there's no hack to it. Do you know what is metaphysics? Do you know what is Yes, I know it. Okay. It's the physics of the physics uh -huh. is metaphysics. Uh -huh. The mother of the physics. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, the problem with like, you know, people who do PhD in physics and economics are they only are designed to get Nobel Prizes or create all these destructive things. Yeah. Uh, which is what yeah. probably took you to the Navy, right? I mean, that that could have been the possibility somehow. Anyway, yeah. but we'll, we'll go to that later. But okay. so you end up in America in 1990. Yeah. And how was America like at that point of oh time? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. It was so different from now. And I remember there's this movie where these Jamaican sliding team, they go to the U.S. and they have the shock of cold. That's how I was. You know, oh, never... yeah. Coming from Mumbai, right? Yes. I landed in U.S. in Dayton, Ohio. And I walked out on December 25th. Ooh. It was so cold and all I was wearing was a leather jacket. That's okay. it. 
So yeah, leather jacket was considered very warm, right in India? Yeah, right. <laughs> it was the Mumbai leather jacket, more for fashion than okay. for warmth. So it was very different, and uh, but you know, Vishal, I just I don't know. I I know I sound like a broken record, but I was so driven by my goal of doing a PhD. Nothing mattered. But how can there be a goal to do a PhD? I just I don't, don't get it. It was just a crazy. I don't, I can't explain. I mean, I just I just wanted to do it. That's it. Okay. But why not PhD from India? Weren't institutes good enough over here? No, it's not that. I mean, I went to Institute of Science in Bombay, and it was only a science college, and we were we had very good professors. In fact, uh, my physics professor, Dr. Sate, I totally, totally adore him. Uh, he's the reason why I did my masters in physics in India. It's nothing like that, but I think. I had just set my mind that I am going to America. That's it. Mm. And uh, and w- was it something to do with your then boyfriend wanting to go to America <laughs> by any chance? So you're peeling all the layers <laughs> one at a time. Yeah. So I, when I was in my second years of my bachelor program, I was what 18 years old. I met my husband, and he had joined the university also, Institute of Science. But he came in as a first-year student. So I was a second-year student, then he was a first-year student. And um, I think I fell in love with him instantly the moment I saw him. He looked so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> he looked delicious. Okay. He looked delicious, yeah. So now you Sorry. sound like, you know, the queen ant who's <laughs> trying to eat the smaller ants, but yeah. that's okay. Um and it was, I mean, I just, I'm, we... So we, how much of you going to America was actually doing PhD from America and actually, you know, following your uh, then boyfriend, now husband? So let me correct you here. First of all, I didn't follow him. Okay. He followed me. Okay, okay. So whatever. I went to... So that's a different deal. <laughs> I think when we get him on the show, we will get the right story, but okay. Sure. Yeah. No, because... His actually, version is you were following him, yeah, but your version the, is... It's, look at the timestamp, Okay. I went to the U.S. in December of 1990. He came to U.S. in August of 1991. So who followed whom? But he said he was always in America. He was born in America. I, I didn't know that when I met him. I just saw. And okay, anyway, so <laughs> so whoever followed who? So yeah. you end up in America yeah. and you go to this college. But mm-hmm. again, you had to do master's there again? Yeah, I because they didn't have a PhD program. And... Um, I got admission in the physics department quite effortlessly. Uh, I had good credentials from my master's that I did in India. The only thing is, because it was in the middle of the academic year, I didn't get a financial aid. So I had to take a student loan. I think I took it from Bank of Baroda, if I'm not mistaken. Bank of Baroda gave loans at that time? I know. Somehow my dad managed to get me like two and a half lakhs of rupees. And that was enough only for one semester tuition. That's it. And um, I was like, okay. So then there's no plan B, right? Where's the plan B? There's no plan B. You have tuition only for one semester. You go and then you just have to figure it, figure it out. So, so you I, were working for McDonald's? No, no, no. International student. You can't, you can't just work. You have to get either some sort of a scholarship or a financial aid. So... My uh, department head, Dr. Bambakidis, is a wonderful man. Dr. Bamboo. <laughs> no, he was a Greek. Um, Bambakidis. Bambakidis. Okay. Yeah. We used to call him Dr. B. Dr. B. Okay. So I literally camped outside his office over the next two, three months. And I would walk into his office, Dr. B, I will do anything. I will grade papers. I will, you know, clean the lab. I will do anything. But I need a financial aid. And I think I finally broke him and he gave me one third financial aid. So not the full stipend. I got one third of the stipend. But what that did was it gave me a full tuition waiver. I didn't have to pay tuition at all. And I actually started earning about $256 a month. So that was a big deal. So means for the a, fees was waived for you. Fees was completely waived for me. Mm-hmm. So only thing that I had to do was... I don't think I had to pay for my books either. So you were really good at persuasion even then, huh? 
I was very driven. That's it. I mean, I guess so. Yes. Yeah. So you I was a good basically, salesperson. yeah, you were like, <laughs> don't charge me any tuition fee and give me money. Yes, yes, uh, I got two hundred and fifty-six dollars a month, and then it's it's good that I did because I finally moved out of my cousin's house, and um, for whatever reason, let's not go into that, you know, family drama, and um, landed up uh, on the street with two suitcases. So then I was like, what to do? But I had made a very good friend. His name was Kirk, Kirk Fuller. So Kirk, I remember it was a Sunday. Captain Kirk. I know. Like, see, I have so many interesting people I came across. Um, he, it was a Sunday afternoon, and he came and picked me up and took me to his friend's house, who happened to be a Pakistani girl who was doing bachelor's in physics. So I landed up in her house, but in her apartment, but she already had roommates and the only space that was available was a walk-in closet. So I rented the walk-in closet. <laughs> you rented the yes. walk-in closet. Okay. Yeah, but no, in America, the walk-in closet itself would be big as a Bombay house. So yeah, you okay. could fit a, like a little twin bed in it and have <laughs> still have one foot of space to walk around it. That was plenty, right? Plenty of living space. So I did that. You know, Vishal, um, I can go on and on about the interesting experiences I've had as a young, single Indian girl in, in, America. in America. And at that time, America was very, very different for us. It Things didn't come easily. You had to literally work hard towards it. I remember getting my social security number. I must have made like two or three trips. I had no, no car, no way to access the federal building. I had to, like, request people to give me a ride. It was just very difficult. But you know what? Looking back, all those were such forming experiences for me. They made me be so strong that I have come to a point where I don't hear no as an answer. If I ask you to do something and you say no, I walk away thinking maybe. Mm. I don't listen to a no. You know, so I'm thankful for all those experiences. Yeah, yeah, you forget about saying no. You could also make people give you the tuition fee and also give you more salary <laughs> on top of it. <laughs> so when did you finish your studies in the US? So I which think, year? yeah, so because I switched from physics to electrical engineering. Wow. So why did you switch from physics to physics was your favorite subject? Yeah. So I did my master's in superconducting material. One second, one second. What, what? Master's in? Superconducting material. Superconductor. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what is a superconducting material? Uh, yttrium, barium, copper oxide. That, is that this what is go, going to space? All the spaceships <laughs> have that? Yeah. So Or they are used in WMDs, right? No, they actually we were making that to make super magnets. Super so, magnets. Yeah. You were making super magnets. Yes. So what is a super magnet <laughs> different from a magnet? <laughs> super magnet uses very, very little electricity and uh, can function for a very long time. And yes, you are right. It is a lot of it at that time was for space use because this research was being done at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So as an international student, I could not go to the Air Force Base, but I could do the research in the university and support that. So that was, yeah. So you were working in Oh my in God, super, you're making me remember all these things that I'd forgotten so long ago. Superconducting materials yeah. and uh, nuclear physics. No, <laughs> not nuclear physics. Okay, electrical engineering. <laughs> Solid state physics. Solid state physics, physics sorry. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> my knowledge of physics has only come from movies. <laughs> yeah, so no, I, di I was working in that and... Just around that time, there was a very big project in the U.S. They were going to build a super collider. Um, this, is, this is around the time of the Cold War, right? Uh -huh, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, God. And so that's around the time that they killed all the research in, um, around physics. And uh, so I realized when I, when I went to Texas A&M University, because... And now, in this case, I did follow my husband to Texas A&M okay. University. Okay, so, so I you did follow him. I followed him there. He was already doing his PhD in organic. He is also a PhD. Yes. He's PhD in what? Organic chemistry. So, what does a PhD in organic chemistry actually mean? Sorry, I, I have no idea of all these subjects. <laughs> he basically can make drugs. Okay. So that's why I jokingly call him my drug dealer. So, what kind of drugs can he make? 
Uh, I don't like organic chemistry, but from what I understood, he was working on cancer drugs. And, oh, that uh, kind of drugs. Yeah. I, was, I was thinking of, <laughs> you know, all the drugs which were in Breaking Bad. No, 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 no. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. <laughs> um, so you had like the perfect uh, husband is the drug dealer and <laughs> you are the nuclear <laughs> weapon master, <laughs> <laughs> weapon master and uh, you con- superconducting magnets and all these things. Yeah, no. So he um, he was doing his PhD at a and and I decided to join him after I finished my master's. And um, I did get an admission in the physics department. But then I realized that and by that time, we had planned on getting married. And I knew that he's a U.S. citizen, so I could get my green card effortlessly. And I could get my citizenship, too. So I started thinking about jobs at that time. And I realized that if there is a time for me to make a switch in my career, then this is the time. So I actually did consider taking the MCATs and going into medicine, because mm-hmm. I could do that, right? I was going to have a change in career and uh, one of the families that I was living with in Dayton Ohio he was an endocrinologist I Mm -hmm. think and um, he kept telling me Jocelyn why do you want to do a PhD just go for medical school and uh, so I thought about it but I honestly truth be told I thought it'd be easier to do a PhD than go to medical school (laughs) easy to do PhD (laughs) Wow. And that too in uh, solid state magnetic uh, organic chemistry. I swear it. I thought I was like, Korn itna padega to become a doctor, you know. Let me just do a PhD. (laughs) At least medicine wala doctor kuch dawai to de sakte hai. Like like the current doctor cannot give any. Can you give people magnets? (laughs) That's what I thought. I'm being honest. I, I was, I had a moment of laziness, you know. So, so in a moment of laziness, you decide to do PhD in electrical engineering. Electrical engineering. Yeah, and because in the department there was a professor who was actually looking for someone to do research on electronic materials, and because I had worked with superconducting materials, I, I knew something about materials, and I knew something about material science. So my. So which were your favorite materials? You know, it's very interesting. I don't care for precious metals. So, what do I mean? Uh, blue light emitting material. Blue light emitting materials. What That's are those? Gallium nitride. I think that was the material that was being researched heavily. But I worked on zinc oxide. Zinc oxide. What yeah. is that? Zinc oxide is just a compound semiconductor. And when you put a little bit of tungsten in it, it emits blue light. That was my research topic. That, okay, so you so add... So your research topic was to emit blue light. No, the discovery of blue light from zinc oxide doped with tungsten was already in existence that my professor had already stumbled upon. We needed to find out why is it emitting blue light. That's you could just why... ask, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> once you make the superconducting material, you can just ask it, right? Yeah. I mean, can't you? I mean, I thought that this is what the whole idea of uh, mm-hmm. physics is, right? No, no, no. There was a, a lot of experimentation and required, a lot of work that went so, in. So your PhD was to find that blue light answer? Yes, my PhD was to find the reason behind the blue light emission from the compound. They must have put one blue paper behind it. <laughs> no? How much time have you spent in a university? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my idea. That blue light RM, matlab something, that blue gelatin paper. Uh, no. So what was the answer? How did you found that answer in your yeah, PhD? Yeah, 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 I did, I did. So, and it was a very interesting Eureka moment. I, rem- I still remember it was, a, it was in the middle of the night. There was nobody in the lab. And I say, oh, it's zinc tungstate. And, you know, and that was it. I, so the answer was what? Zinc tungstate. Zinc tungstate. Yeah, zinc tungstate. When you form zinc tungstate at the right, in the right composition, and you excite it with the right type of energy, it emits blue light. So wow. you have to like create the perfect storm. So this looks more like a lesson in PhD and physics and chemistry to the people out here than anything else. Oh really? I never knew all these things happened to zinc. Yeah, it's, I thought zinc should be science is cool. Food. Science is fun. I don't, I don't see why people think that you know physics is boring. You know, science is a lot of fun. 
No, no, it certainly seems to be that. The Vishal Gondal Show will be right back after this break. Hey everybody, welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcast on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Speaking of social media, one of the things that we really enjoy doing is we love seeing screenshots of people listening to our shows. So if you're listening to something and you want to let us know what you think about things, just take a screenshot, post it to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and tag us and we'll tag you back and we'll talk to you and we'll let you know what we think or what do you think. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for this month, Savari Storytel and Paytm Money. We really appreciate the support. Also, on another note, an IVM-related note, we're looking to hire. We're looking for producers, content creators, audio engineers, back-end developers. We're looking for somebody in the data specialist kind of space, graphic designers. We're looking for all different kinds of people. So if you want to join one of the best places to work there is out there, then send us an email to careers at indusfox.com with your resume, and we'll get back to you shortly. On Cyrus Says, actress and soon-to-be director Tiska Chopra talks to Cyrus about her childhood in Afghanistan, how she got pulled into acting, her new original web series Hostages, and how she's looking to write and direct more in the future. On the Ronnie Screwwala podcast, Ronnie talks to me about the pursuit of inflection points, understanding the size of markets, and the importance of brand in creating scales. Speaking of the Ronnie Screwwala podcast, if you want to send us some questions for Ronnie for his last episode, then please do so. It's at shows at indusvox.com. In case you missed it, check out episode 4 of The Note with Maruk and Nayan. She lists five reasons why Rahul Gandhi stepping down is the right decision. On Shunya 1, Sheila Ditya and I are joined by Sachin Parekh, founder of Easy Roads. Easy Roads is a great platform that allows you to do local road trips and we discuss the startup and the tech behind it and local travel. On the Empowering series, Zarina talks to Hetal Desai, senior VP at N Paradigm. They discuss different reasons why people quit their jobs, the importance of interpersonal relationships between employees and employers and more. On the Pragati Podcast, economist Anupam Manur is in conversation with Pawan about where Britain stands in regards to Brexit three years later and why it has cost them two prime ministers. And with that, let's continue on with your show. So you finish your PhD in yeah. finding the blue light. Yeah. And uh, once you found that blue light, yeah. how did you land up in a military compound? So this is the second time I'm going to admit that I followed my husband again. <laughs> was he in the military too? No, no. He was working for a German company in San Diego. Okay. And um, I did have my my professor, Dr. Weichold, he was a very good research scientist. In fact, we published quite a few papers together, uh, him and I. Oh, you publish papers also? Yeah. Yeah, I'm published. So if you Google me, uh, research papers will come up uh, with my name. You have patents also in your name? No, I do not have any patents okay. on my name. Um, of which what we may be classified, I don't know. Yeah, and let's not talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, I did have an opportunity to work for companies like Texas Instrument or Intel. But I really wanted to go to San Diego and look for a job because my husband was already there. And by that time, I was, what, 33 years old, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to have a family also. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I spoke with my advisor, and I told Dr. Baikol that, you know, I need to go and find a job in San Diego. So one of my committee chairs, Dr. Taylor, he's no more now, he had done a lot of work in San Diego at a naval research lab. It was not NRL, but it was a naval research lab in San Diego. So he put me in touch with somebody, and I had an interview, and I got hired. Wow. So, so you get hired in the U.S. Navy yeah. in, what, 1990-something? Which year no, was this? No, it will be 2000. 2000. Yeah. In the year 2000, mm -hmm. based on this blue light you have found and all mm -hmm. these other things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how was that? I mean, you know, like U.S., and this is when, you know, uh, I don't think so. Uh, the Cold War had ended. Hmm. I think the first Iraq War was 84, correct? This no, is... not 84. I think oh. 2004. No, that was the second. That was after 9-11. This is the uh -huh. one before 9-11. But it had ended, I think. By 2000, it had ended, no? Yeah, it had ended. Right? Yeah, but I'm just saying yeah. that, you know, like going and working for the U.S. Navy. Yeah, yeah. It's not a career choice of many Indians. Indians go to America, they become doctors. Yeah. Or if they're in New York, they open a deli or a, a petrol pump. Or, you know, the cliches are very different. I mean, I've yeah. not heard of many Indians who go and join yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I've heard of NASA. I mean, there are many Indian scientists it, in NASA. That was actually one of my choices. I did want to go work for... Yes, I did. I wanted to work so for NASA. So you narrowly missed working for NASA? I did. I, I wanted to do that. But again, that would have put me away from my husband. Uh, so you didn't want to go to Houston or where? No, or... I did not. I wanted to go to San Diego. And during my interview, when they explained the kind of research that they were doing, they were working on optical actuators and there was a lot of optical networking involved in that but they were doing some material science related research work with UCSD so I could you know jump into it without much preparation or much and how easy was it to get into the navy was there a lot of like do they have a huge process or how do- yeah there was quite a bit of process in fact when I got interviewed for the job I was not a citizen so I could not be hired by the US Navy right and um, they hired me as a contractor because I was a permanent resident. And for six months, I worked as a permanent resident. But I did the research work. Um, and uh, I was already in the process of getting my citizenship. So I, the moment I got my citizenship, I got hired by the Navy. Mm. Yeah. And then, like, what What were you as a captain or what kind no, of... No, no, no. I was. I got hired as a civilian. So we were considered employees of U.S. Navy. But we were a group called... We basically represented, like, the Scientists at Sea program uh, for the Navy. Scientists at Sea. Yeah. Mm. We had... I had very good colleagues who had PhD in physics, chemical engineering. So we had a pretty good group of people. Wow. So now you end up in the U.S. Navy. I mean, mm-hmm. this is like the biggest, you know, the military in the most powerful military in the world. And now the blue light, which you had researched, yeah. you were trying to make that blue light work for the U.S. Navy. What were your thoughts around it? I mean, did you have anything in mind that what am I now doing? I am now going to use physics for good or physics for bad? It's very interesting, Vishal. You know, I... With so much, I mean, I've been talking about my drive, my drive, my drive. Really, honestly, all I wanted to do was be a good wife and a mom. Mm-hmm. And I have a good job. You know? And in that, I you're like, okay, I did a PhD and I'm working for the US Yeah, Navy. Yeah, it's, and, and so if, if the blue light emitting material work that I did, it got left again behind at the university. And now I was working with optical networking materials. So it was completely different work, but it didn't matter. It was, it was very enjoyable work. I really enjoyed doing what I was doing. And networking at that time was really becoming very popular. That was like the beginning of, you know, Local area networking, this wide is the area networking. Early days of Wi Fi. Exactly, exactly. So there was a lot of work that was happening. So for me, it became again a very exciting thing. Oh, I'm working on something new, right? Left the uh, superconducting material research work behind. Done. Been there, done that, you know. Superconducting Next, material being there, done that. Okay. Ho gaya. Then the electronic material with the compound semiconductors. That also done. Next thing that I wanted to really get into and learn was networking. How the heck does it work, right? No, no, but your networking was not to connect some offices. Your networking was to connect weapon system and all these kinds of <laughs> things, right? System. I mean, let's not call it <laughs> networking. Networking is like how office may network laga rahe word star or yeah. word processing ke liye. Your network Networking was some serious networking. Yeah, so it's very, uh, my break into networking actually came with this, um, part of it is unclassified. I think I can talk about it. Yeah, we don't uh, want you to talk of any classified no, no, things no, no, no. on I this will podcast. Not, I, I will not do that. So I was part of this team that was working on building um, standalone Wi-Fi networks. So you could basically go and throw a Wi-Fi network for communication, whether it was over a one-mile radius or a 10-mile radius, depending on what type of FTP you wanted to do, what type of data exchange you wanted to do. That was the early time for Wi-Fi networking. So I worked on that project, and I was uh, pregnant with my second daughter at that time. Mm -hmm. And the Baghdad war was going on. This was during that. The Baghdad yeah. Baghdad, no Baghdad. Acha Baghdad. Fine, <laughs> America yeah. ke Baghdad. Now, see, I'm, I'm, in my na- I'm in my Navy mode. You know, I'm, you, I'm yeah, yeah, my- Baghdad. <laughs> <ko Baghdad kar laughs> but that's what was going okay, on. The Baghdad war, war is going, going on, on and yeah. you are trying to use your superconductor <laughs> blue emitting Got material. left behind. <laughs> 
into setting up networks. So you are the yeah. one making sure that people can uh, actually take Saddam Hussein down. <laughs> and we had a little part in it. Yeah. <laughs> but crazy, right? I mean, look at your life from, you know, being doing some physics experiment here and there yeah. to trying to, you know, get your fee waved off. Yeah. Suddenly you are in the middle of a battlefield trying to network all yeah. these expensive military equipment and people. Yeah, no, it was it was fun. It was a good. It was a good. I think I just looked at it as a, at it as a project. No, but you know, did, I'm working did on it a ever project. occur That's to it. you that you know you are in a way aiding a war which is killing people? You yeah. know. So did that ever occur to you at all? See, I okay. I was not active duty. No, but you I mean, know, you, but you but, don't have to be active duty. Right, you are. But I had been on enough. Navy vessels and enough Navy ships to realize that my my work makes a difference. My work makes makes um, makes things happen. So for me, it was making sure that I'm doing my job well and making sure I'm doing my job right. In fact, I don't know if I ever told you this, Vishal. Uh, Pooja, you know Pooja, right? The, my second daughter. When I was pregnant with her. Aditya got a very good opportunity to go to Germany for a management training. But the problem with that was that he had to leave a day after she was born. So he left on uh, the day after she was born. And unfortunately, at that time, I was working on that Wi-Fi project that I told you about. So I couldn't take a maternity leave. So I took 10 days off to have my baby to recover a little bit, just a little bit, enough to where I could go back to my lab, finish that work, and then I took a three-month maternity leave. So it was just a matter of commitment. You know, you you, you set a commitment to completing something and you just do it. Wow. No plan that's, B. That's serious commitment, right? Yeah. And that's serious commitment. Yeah. And no wonder Indians do so well yeah. in America, right? Be it any field. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've talked about medicine. We've talked about uh, businessmen and the portals and the motels, which all our <laughs> uh, Gujarati brothers own. But you were kind of making your, your name in a completely... I, I don't know. Of many, maybe now there are a few more. Yeah. But in that time, were there a lot of Indians in the U.S. No, army no. or navy? No. In fact, I had some very, very interesting sailing trips. Um, usually, we sailed for about four or five days for our um, exercises. But there was this one Trident Warrior exercise I went on that was nine or ten days long, and this was just before Puja was turning one. And it was a sailing trip to Hawaii. And during our sail from San Diego to Hawaii, we had to do Trident Warrior exercises between... What is Trident uh, Warrior exercises? That was just the name of a project. Okay. Trident Warrior okay. was the name of a project. But the Trident Warrior exercises uh, were being conducted between Australia, Canada, New Zealand, England, and the U.S. So there were mm. five countries involved in doing this communication testing. Because at that time, I was working on wide area networking for the U.S. fleet. So I was part of one of the engineers who was on the ship um, studying, understanding information exchange. Again, And what was the reaction of people, you know, like finding, you know, an Indian woman in a ship doing all these things? What was the reaction of those people? It was, um, it was okay. I mean, I, I would have some... Some people walk up to me and say, oh, you look so exotic, you know. (laughs) But I didn't let it go to my Uh, head. (laughs) You said, no, no, I'm not Indian, like one of those Indian uh, tribes. (laughs) No, I'd say, no, I'm very happily married. (laughs) That's what I would say. But yeah, it was different. It was definitely not easy, but I don't know. Life is full of those challenges, right? So, so big deal that I was... I was actually the only Indian at that time, Indian girl. I would not see other Indian girls on the on the U.S. fleet or U.S. ships that I went on. But then 9-11 happened and yeah. did that change anything for you? No. I was a Navy civilian and I did my job. And actually at that time I was doing the wide area networking. We did do some classified work. I can't talk about that. Yeah, yeah please don't. Um, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> um, so it was, um, it was fine, you know. Uh, in that sense, I would say that the, 
armed services in the U.S., they really don't have any discrimination. I mean, I may have felt a little bit here or there. In fact, I felt more discrimination in the university than I felt in the U.S. Navy. No, no, I mean, I've heard a lot of stories of how disciplined and what a great yeah. system the U.S. armed forces have mm-hmm. in general. Yeah, I had very good experience. I was a little bit sad when I had to finally leave my Navy job. But then, you know, life throws a curveball at you and you just have to make sure you, that you connect with it and hit a home run, right? So yeah, we, we don't understand these baseball oh analogies. Oh, my God. We are all <laughs> about cricket. Too much of an American. <laughs> yeah, we are like cricket or, you know, chakka marna padta hai, curve ball. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Curve ball came, so chakka maro, it's okay. It feels good, right? So, yes. <laughs> okay. So, so here you are, yeah. you were trying to find the blue light, then you were trying to find some exotic metal and then you go to the Navy, work yeah. on all these secret and classified projects, you go on all these yeah. Navy vessels and all the active war zones Yeah, and then you apply for the super top, top secret clearance. <laughs> yes. Then I what did. happened? Did they give you that clearance? <laughs> um, so I applied for that uh, top secret clearance thinking that, you know, my job is good, my project is good, but there are other interesting projects that mm. I could work on. But a lot of those interesting projects, if I would talk to them about it, the first like question... Like OBL, right? Everybody's talking of OBL. You know OBL, right? <laughs> let, no, let's Osama Bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, the biggest project for America, find all the scientists to go and find Osama. <laughs> so I would apply for these projects. These, and the first question they would ask me is, what type is your clearance? And I would say, secret. And they say like Secret not, is not good not, enough. I, it was not good enough. <laughs> he said, I, we wish that you had top secret clearance. You know, your credentials are good and everything. But because you don't have top oh secret God, clearance. Oh God, what a problem, you know. right? Top so secret like, oh. clearance. Yeah, secret clearance. So I'm like, what the heck? You know, okay, let's go apply for top secret clearance. Go. And so you so applied for paperwork. top secret clearance. Yeah, I, I did the paperwork. So you went very secretly to do that? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> So I couldn't do it secretly because I had to inform all my family members that I am applying for this. So whatever, whoever was in contact with me, I had to inform. So the, it's an amazing life to have, right? If anybody asks you a tough question, you can say, sorry, I can't answer. It's classified. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But then... <laughs> sorry, I can't answer it. The milk is missing because it's classified. <laughs> Um, yeah, I did. I, I went through the paperwork and, you know, it was the last stages of approval. And the guy who was interviewing me, he, he told me, he said, you know, I see that you have a lot of family in India and it's good. And I see that you visit your family quite often, which is good. And I see that your brother-in-law is in Coast Guard which is fine. Indian Coast Guard, yeah. And that to Indian Coast Guard, right? So so I asked him, I asked him point blank. I said, is that a conflict, you know? He's like, no, not unless you're passing on secret information to to your brother-in-law. I said, no, I don't do that. Um, but then he did give me a piece of advice. He said, you know, if you're happy doing your research work or your all your if project, you're happy doing secret then why do yeah, you want exactly why do you want why do you want he to forgot that yourself? you are all about doing the topmost things right yeah, you want everything I, on the I top. know I really wanted it like everything else in my life <laughs> but then I don't know I think that was one time when I listened to his advice and I said okay let my ego not drive me here and let me be sensible and I withdrew my application hmm. I didn't I didn't but I think after all that, and you know, you suddenly decided to quit U.S. Navy. Huh. And then you started a yeah. crazy entrepreneurial journey of setting up <laughs> a, a, a math training center for kids. <laughs> How does this add up, right? I mean, at <laughs> one end, you're applying for top secret clearance and you're making weapon system for wars yeah. and all these things. Yeah. And now you are going to teach people how to add and subtract and multiply. That's right. Yeah. So, so how, how did this, that happen? Yeah. Yeah, you can add, subtract, yeah. karna, to ye PhD, <laughs> double, ye, metal, <laughs> secret, ye sab ki kya thi? Huh? Yeah, that's right. See, what happened was, Vishal, that um, I got pregnant with my son, Neil, at age 43. And uh, I think... Uh, 
No, but you started it, that much before that, right? Your maths thing or no? No, no, no. It culminated because of all these events that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, m- mom passed away mm-hmm. when I was two months pregnant with Neil. And um, I had had a couple of miscarriages before Neil, so it became a very high-risk pregnancy mm-hmm. at age 43. And uh, it was just a very emotionally and physically demanding event that I went through to have Neil. So then you just don't start people training people maths, right, because of that? <laughs> no, huh? yeah, that's right. So I uh, decided, I did go back to work after I had Neil, but I had a very difficult time recovering. So I took, and all my projects that they were giving me, um, were sending me to Washington, D.C., and I just didn't yeah. want to travel. I now you are like Homeland going security. up the ladder. Huh? Yeah, You're going no, up the ladder. Homeland Security was very big, and they were hiring a lot of people. And But but I would have had to go to D.C. for and that. And then you would have to get even top security clearance, <laughs> like top cut top. Huh? Yeah. So, um, so I said... So oh, maybe you never yeah. know, CIA may have also approached you. I you would, know? Who knows? Yeah, there. who knows? Yeah. yeah, I mean, with you, CIA, <laughs> and uh, who's the other agency? NSA. Hmm. All these guys, I mean, you are like the perfect spy, right? You huh. can speak multiple languages, you can do mathematics, you can do nuclear <laughs> physics and blue light. Yeah. See, you're, you're a good storyteller. No, huh? I'm not. I'm just trying to make put two and two together. Why will somebody call you to Washington, D.C.? Yeah. So, I, I didn't want to go. Okay. So, I said, okay, I'm not recovering. I don't want to do these projects. So, let me take an extended sabbatical. So, I took a, a one-year sabbatical from the Navy uh, to heal and get better. And I was literally at home, you know, nursing Neil in the middle of the night I was just thinking, like, what the heck am I going to do? I can't go back to work. I, what am I supposed to do? I was literally looking for an answer. Because I'm not... And you were trying I, to find the answer and you calculated everything and you get answer is mathematics. <laughs> no, it didn't come that, that quick, easily. Because you know, the thing is, Vishal, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a good mom as a working mom. And, and I have a lot of respect for women who stay at home and they raise their children. I have a lot of respect for them, but I cannot do it. I'm a better mom as a working mom. So I was just thinking, like, what am I going to do? And uh, Simran and Pooja, uh, my older daughters at that time, they were doing Kuman. Mm. And uh, Sim- I, one day Simran just came home and she kind of just threw a fit. She's like, I don't want to go to Kuman anymore. I hate doing Kuman. The center is noisy. Nobody helps me. You know, the, the teachers are not good. But she looked at me with so much love in her eyes. She's like, but mommy, I like doing Kuman with you. You teach it so well. Why don't you open a Kuman center? Mm. That's how I got the idea ah. to open the and math I and reading. I thought that you are now part of a secret service agency <laughs> and Kuman is just your front. My front. No, there's no, no front. This. So I just quit my like Navy job. Like people start these, you know, laundry machines and car washes. And so in your case, that you know, if you start a car wash, it may not sound very yeah, good. Yeah, but math sounds good. Yeah, yeah. you're like, okay, you know, so so, yeah. so that was actually a legitimate business. It It is a very legitimate business and I'm very happy to say that my company's name is dedicated to my mom. Mm. So my company name is Tej Education LLC. Tej, like Tej, fast. Like fast. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was in 2011. So you Neil set up was, this training center in uh, New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. In New Jersey. New Jersey, yeah. And that, has, and that yeah. has become like a very, very successful business, right? Yeah, now? it is. In fact, uh, like everything else in my life, I was in a hurry to reach all the milestones, right? So Kuman, as a corporate, uh, they have some milestones. You have to reach 100 enrollments within a year or you have to reach certain milestones, right? I beat them all. Like I was like, I six months, I was boom, I was at 100 enrollments and I just grew my business very, very quickly. But In like, fact, aren't the Kumon guys surprised that normally who the kind of people who open Kumon centers yeah, and I'd you are just, like a PhD yeah. with the uh, blue light and uh, no, metal? No, but you're right. They actually wouldn't give me the franchisee. <laughs> they wouldn't. I had to go and interview with like, the COO or someone to convince him that 
I'm legitimate person who wants to open a <laughs> command center. So, yeah. So, I, um, no, you're I right. I mean, anybody would think that, you know, like, why is like, it's like you opening a, a car wash. Yeah. People will be like, why are you wanting to open a car wash? <laughs> so, no, I, yeah, you're right. I did go through that. But we became a very good and a successful command center very, very quickly. In fact, a year and a half after I had opened the Kuman Center. I got invited by Kuman Corporate at their national meeting. And Kuman is a Japanese speaker. thing, right? Yeah. Basically, origin yeah. is from Japan. Japan, yeah. So they invited me as a, a guest speaker to conduct a workshop on communications mm-hmm. because I because my center did so well. Mm-hmm. So it has been a very good business. We have. Um, I don't want to toot my own horn, but it's a big center. It's a very big center. How many students uh, learn there typically now? Uh, so we have good, well over about 200 to 250 families that come to my center. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and maths yeah. anyway, all the Indians are crazy about maths and spellings, right? All the yeah. spelling B winners are Indians. Yeah, no. And we actually have a very interesting demographic dynamics. We don't have just Indians and Asians. We have a pretty diverse uh, enrollment. We have a lot of Caucasians and African Americans and Latinos. So did the Army call you or the Navy call you back ever and said, you know what, bhot ho gaya this yeah. you know, math training, come back. We have some serious you know, crimes to solve in, uh, you know, conflicts to solve in <laughs> Syria and all these things going on. No, no, Navy never called me back. I think they were done with me. <laughs> well, or you never know. You're still part of it. Yes, and I cannot talk about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the interesting thing is, so yeah, you so you leave all your super exciting Navy job, hopping from, you know, one ship to another ship yeah. on a yeah. F-16 plane and all that. Yeah. And then you start teaching maths. Yes. But then you go back to your blue light. So you leave yes, all this I do go back to now to find light. another kind of yeah. blue light, which is enlightenment in form of meditation. Yes. And then suddenly one day I find that you have forgotten everything and you are like every day morning to night doing meditation and seeking <laughs> blue light with Shri Shri Ravi Shankar. Yeah. So now what happened? Now what happened? Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> I think uh, this happened um, July 6th. 2014 was Aditya's birthday, 46th birthday. And I threw a surprise birthday party for him. And um, it was a nice party and everything. But uh, in the middle of the night, around 1.30, I woke him up. I couldn't get a breath of air into my lungs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told him, I said, Beba, I can't. I can't breathe. And he panicked. He's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm trying. I'm trying to get air into my lungs, but I cannot do it. But how are you explaining this if you can't breathe? Well, you know, with with a lot of difficulty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to show you? <laughs> no. um, so he called 911 and I was rushed to the hospital. So this is like a emergency. complete movie scene. Huh? I know. It was a complete like, I had like this red and blue light in my driveway and we had a live-in nanny at that time. So we could leave the kids at home and we told who was it yeah and we went and but the emergency room physician he ruled out that it was a panic attack because I looked very normal I just couldn't get a breath of air in that's it that was my only complaint but I looked normal I was smiling the Russians trying to poison you maybe they came and poisoned my water (laughs) (laughs) and um, so I went through extensive uh, testing and everything there was nothing wrong with me physiologically and uh, my doctor at that time she said you know which is true like I've always been you've known me long enough now that I'm a glasses half full kind of person I believe in plan A I do not believe in plan B whatever you do you set your mind to it you go with you jump with your feet first you think about it later right so I think all Years of just, you know, going after things and just achieving, achieving, achieving. It f- and so much stress had happened. I had Neil, which was an unplanned pregnancy at 43. Then mom passed away. Oh, after that, Aditya got laid off. Um, he um, had to do a change of job. So there was so much that had happened 
that I think the f- stress finally caught up to me. Mm-hmm. And on the surface, I had always looked normal and happy. In fact, at that time, my signature, my email signature was too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> <laughs> Too blessed to be stressed. That's right. And you are stressed the most stressed. <laughs> exactly. Then I'll end up in the emergency room. <laughs> so my doctor, she said, you know, I know what you've gone through in the last four years. Why don't you start meditating? So Your it was doctor told my you doctor start. told me. She did give me a prescription to Prozac too. She said, when the moment you feel like a little bit of anxiety coming on, you can pop a pill. But I, my suggestion is, start meditating and i did i started with headspace i downloaded headspace and i started meditating and i did both both aditi and i my husband aditi and i we did that for many months but in march of 2015 while he was visiting india he was visiting his mom it was her birthday i was home alone with the kids and around 11 o'clock I had that same feeling coming up in me Ooh, that yeah the second time second the Russians time. were attacking you second time my water got <laughs> polluted by the Russians <laughs> and uh, no, but the Russians uh, are no longer a threat right <laughs> no they are they are threatened somewhere else now <laughs> and, and not in my household um and I since I knew the symptoms and before it got worse I called my neighbor, uh, Lily came over to stay with the kids and I, I drove myself to the emergency room oh. because it is a thousand dollars to call the ambulance. You call uh, 911 and ambulance comes home, you have to pay a thousand dollars. You have to pay money for that? I thought it is free. Oh my gosh. It's not uh, don't, free. Don't even get me started about the healthcare system in the US. Wow, you have to it pay was, for that. I thought that America uh, mein our nine one one. No, it's it's too, it's too expensive. So anyway, I go and they had seen my history and they gave me an a breathing treatment and asthma treatment. No, but you know what? This is all about Indians, right? Uh-huh. Even when they are sick and they have emergency, they are trying to save money. Huh? <laughs> no, I had already paid about $12,000. That's what I'm saying, the previous, right? For so the this previous time, if episode. I get a panic attack, wait, I am not going to call 911. I'm no, I'm drive driving myself. myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that and they gave me two breathing treatments and then they labeled my condition that I have developed transient asthma. Which is ridiculous. How many times you and I have gone for a run, a long run? You really think that I am the kind of person who had asthma? I told you the Russians were doing something with me. That's <laughs> what my theory is. So anyway, I um, that happened and I was like, okay, so the meditation is working but not 100%. I stumbled into a board that said breathing, meditation, relaxation, stress management. And it happened to be the board of Art of Living. But I had there not are heard. these other boards of tarot card reading, no, hypnosis. No, 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 no. So, so, board dikha bahar ja ke, you said I'll go there. <laughs> no, I, I had not. Up to that point, I had not heard of Art of Living. In fact, I did not know about Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. I had never heard of him. And... The person there, I just went, walked up to them and it was a vendor, vendor stall at an event. And uh, I told them, I said, ha, 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 I should do this because I obviously don't know how to breathe. You didn't I say, keep... I want to find the blue light. <laughs> no, no. I said, you know, I obviously don't know how to breathe because I've landed up in the emergency room twice. And I made a joke out of it. But then they told me about the Sudarshan Kriya and, and I have I was I was at a point where I was like, you know what? I've spent thousands of dollars. <laughs> I have a I have a prescription for steroids for an asthma condition that I don't think I have. So I have to spend a four hundred dollars in figuring out what the heck is all this about. So let me give it a shot. So I called Aditya and I told him, I said, Babe, you know it's a program, five day program. What do you think? Should I do it? And he said, yeah, go for it's it. It's called the happiness program. It's or called the happiness program. The happiness program. And the most happy are they, right? You're paying them $400. <laughs> yeah. Happily. That, yes, very happily. <laughs> happily, I paid that money and went for that program. And we shall, it's, I know I'm going to sound very, um, a little bit uh, abstract here, but the moment I, did Sudarshan Kriya, I felt like a big load of bricks had come off my back. I felt so relaxed. For the first time, I actually felt like I could breathe. My lungs were squeaky clean. Then I, I, I felt so 
relieved but isn't this like normal yoga right i mean these are all done like these are all no, like then no, no, no. been there for thousands of years no 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 my what is so my special dear in friend, sudarshan kriya oh my gosh my dear friend you have to experience sudarshan kriya to know what i'm talking about it is a very very special breathing isn't based isn't that kapal bha- kapal bhati or no, one of these yoga it's, things it's 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 the mother of kapal bhati okay, it's the mother of kapal bhati wow <laughs> Kapal Bhati itself is a few thousand years old. See, and it's a mother of that. So okay. can you imagine how powerful that wow. is? And I did that the very first day I did it. The teacher in me woke up <laughs> again, mm. and uh, I walked up to my teacher. Uh, her name is Annalise. Annalise Richmond was my teacher, and I walked up to Annalise and I said, "Annalise, how do I learn this to teach? I want to be a teacher for this." and she's like okay you need to become an art of living teacher then and oh, that's again it. right so this part of what you are saying just doesn't add up right <laughs> you are physics uh, phd <laughs> you are doing all these logical things super intelligent uh-huh. you are about to get top security clearance yeah and then you go for all these you know sudarshan kriya and blue light watching kind of yeah. things how do these how does this add up how does this add up i guess see uh the meaning of the word sudarshan is su means proper and darshan means vision oh, no i'm not debating i know i know i'm not i'm not i'm telling you i'm just explaining so sudarshan means proper vision of yourself maybe i got a proper vision of myself and i decided to make a u turn and go inwards mm. so how can physics explain all this physics physics is the basics of the entire existence of cosmos and at the end of the day you and i are nothing but energy energy particles so physics sudarshan kriya you and i we are all connected so so you are saying this is just an extension of your phd in physics exactly yeah so that's sudarshan so kriya so i think my understanding of quantum mechanics led me to really understand the importance of sudarshan kriya and what it was doing to me at my cellular level so what did it do at a cellular level you experience it then you will know no what what did it do to you i mean i can experience it, it later the, it, it exactly what i said it took i felt like it took this big load of bricks that i had been carrying i just just dropped it i just dropped it and i felt so light and so happy no, but isn't that any form of therapy right you could just call this therapy you know yeah of mm-hmm. course it's spiritual therapy mm-hmm. see I don't mean to sound like a very guru crazy person or like something like that but you know my mom's passing me having neil me going through all the challenges that I went through I felt like it was just the start of me finding something mm-hmm. discovering something and coming and even even when I experienced sudarshan kriya I did not know shri shri ravi shankar when I met him 3 months later then it all came together like oh my god I have found a living guru. <laughs> okay. You know, I know I know it sounds strange, but it's that's the feeling that I had. Okay. I'm just sharing with you what I felt. And I just felt that only when you have the guru grace in your life, everything comes together. So what you know so again, normally we always assume that a lot of the shishyas of these gurus are people who are not very illiterate people who come from very you know hmm. lower backgrounds and hmm. who are mentally not very strong hmm. and here we have you who's like the super successful entrepreneur yeah. nuclear physics uh, secret clearance yeah. war zones everything and you are now doing all of this how this is kind of strange for a lot of people to understand yeah so it is a little bit difficult to understand but at the same time it's very simple because unless you have true happiness within unless you are truly complete within you cannot be an effective individual you cannot be an effective uh, mom or a wife or a parent and in fact the more i delved into this the more i experienced it in fact within a very short period of, of time like within 5 months i did three other advanced courses that were offered by art of living because for me i felt like the the gates of knowledge had opened and i just want to i just wanted to learn absorb learn absorb i'd learned to do mantra based meditation sahaj samadhi 
I just I just fell in love with it. I went to a silence course where I was in silence for four days. Four days I did not talk. And I can like talk and talk and talk. I, I know was, yeah. uh, your husband was very happy about yeah, it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that, you, know you were not talking four days. For four I was days. in silence yeah, and it was incredible. I couldn't, I couldn't explain how enjoyable that was. Then I did a volunteer training program because Art of Living is a volunteer based organization. So I did all that. You know, Vishal, the more I did and the, all the programs that I did, I came across the programs for the children, what it does for that. I felt like this is what I want to do. Right now, I'm 51 years old. I have done 50 years of achieving academic success, professional success. success, Military success. All <laughs> kinds of success. But that's it, enough. Now I wanted to do something beyond that, something that is meaningful. So, you know, this is one thing which people find it difficult to understand. And I think a lot of people who have now seen Wild Wild Country, the famous uh, mm -hmm. a documentary on uh, Osho. Yes. And how Osho with his message was able to entice the whole of America. Yeah. So, is it similar to that, the impact of Shri Shri on America and what he's doing with meditation and yoga? You know, it's... It, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because... It almost appeared so effortless that Osho was able to influence America so much, right? You won't believe how hard it is for us to bring this message of happiness program to people. And these are all scientific techniques. There is nothing, you know, wishy-washy about it. No hokey-pokey business. It's very scientific. And people are very stressed. It is just to manage their stress. I mean, it's it, just it to is manage said that, mind. you know, uh, so, I think three out of five Americans are on some kind of yes, mental therapy medication. Exactly. Right? I mean, the statistics are very alarming, not just adults. And now my focus has shifted towards children because more I speak with the kids, more I speak with the teachers. And I, last summer I went through a 10-day program, training program for Yes for School. It's, a, again, a breathing-based meditation or stress management program that can be taught in schools. So I went for training to become a teacher for that. And uh, I'm realizing that the children need that kind of support. The children need that kind of exposure because they're really getting stressed out. So it's they're difficult really to get adults to take up meditation. Yeah. How, how will you take have kids do meditation? Yeah, that's... that's In fact, they have, you know, their minds are all more over restless. The place. Right? Yeah. So, um, you know that Neil is on the autism spectrum, mm -hmm. right? And Neil's attention was that of a bird. If you can imagine your brain uh, like a strobe light, which goes on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, right? So his attention span was like that. It's very, very small. He does do breathing-based meditation techniques. And he is at a point where I can get him to sit and focus for a half an hour and get him to do his math work. So gradually that happens. These are all play-based and breathing-based techniques that we teach to the children. Also, it's done in a very small, incremental, systematic manner. So it adds up without them realizing that this is helping them. There was a very interesting saying that I came across a couple of years ago by a um, African-American activist who lived in 1800s by the name of Frederick Douglass. And um, he said that it's easier to raise strong children than to fix broken adults. Mm. Wouldn't that make a better society? Absolutely. Yeah. Right? So if we start working on our young ones and our children and really strengthening them, strengthening their mind, and the first step towards being strong or having strength is to have strength within. The Vishal Gondal Show will be right back after this break. Hi, I'm Satyajit. Hi, I'm Racheta. We are from the Open Library Project and we host a podcast called Paperback. Paperback is a podcast where we engage with stalwarts and experts from various industries, suggesting non-fiction titles that contributed to their journey in a big way. We've had guests like Anjali Rena, Dr. Marcus Rani, Dr. Swati Loda, Ambi Parmeswaran, Apurva Damani and many more on our show Paperback. Find new episodes every Wednesday on IVM Podcast app, website or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
so so you are actually almost talking of an alternate education system because Absolutely. like in india you know the education system is gone to the dogs yeah. kids are stressed and yeah. there's this exam pressure yeah. us has its own challenges Absolutely. with schools yeah. and they're all talking about changing education system yeah. changing curricular changing this changing that yeah. but you are saying actually don't change anything no. but introduce meditation to exactly. the existing system exactly exactly and how do you know this is going to work It's going to work. That's the plan A. No, but how do you think it's <laughs> going to work? How do you how think? How many kids have been able to successfully do meditation? So, Yes for School is a program that is administered by IHV, ihv.org. It's an international association for human values. And they have taught this program to as many as over 100,000 children. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's a big push in they just signed a contract with uh, a city Bahia in Brazil where they have a contract to teach a million children and administrators. So this thing works. It's got proven track. It really works. Now it's just a question of finding, you know, strongly single focused people like you and I and then make it happen. Mhm. So. but again you know taking kids to meditation uh in a country like india where suddenly every kid is on his mobile phone playing games mm-hmm. and of course i'm i am part <laughs> You're of partly the, responsible uh, partly for it responsible <laughs> for it uh, how do you move them away from video games to meditate so i don't think it's a question of moving the children away from video games or their technology it's just getting them to carve out just 10 20 minutes of their time to do this so this is more like an add on it's something that you incorporate in your daily life as an add on that's so it so had you you know for a second not being part of uh, you know uh, shri shri and uh, art of living uh, where do you think your life would have taken you i probably would have been popping pills for my anxiety because uh stress is definitely something that's a big part of our lives to cope that to manage that maybe i would be taking some steroids and um um i think that's what i picture being and that's that's how a lot of people are aren't they no, but why is it that and why couldn't there be another alternate path which could have made you better that's what i stumbled into i did not go looking for art of living i just no, no, i'm not i'm just it. saying that yeah. aren't there other alternates of art of living which people could also take up do you really need to be affiliated to art of living or some guru to do this is is my question can't people just <laughs> use apps like calm and headspace and do this yeah absolutely i mean i'm if people want to use calm and headspace there's nothing wrong with it I think as long as people are taking care of their mind that's that's important but like I said I just happened to stumble into art of living I loved it I loved meeting gurudev he is my my teacher my my perfect teacher from whom I'm learning a lot of gathering a lot of knowledge but so how are you gathering a knowledge from him you probably have met him like two or three times or yeah. five times but yeah. how can in the five times he give giving you so much knowledge There, we do have a lot of knowledge series that I'm part of. I read a lot of books, uh, a lot of discourse on different topics like Bhakti Sutra, Patanjali Yoga Sutras, uh, a lot of these different knowledge uh, resources that we have in our country. That's part of our culture, but have been forgotten. So, is there anything which you believed in before, which you no longer believe in after what you have learned through all these interactions of yours? has mm. any of your beliefs changed yes so one very strong belief that has changed is that a very interesting knowledge point that i learned from one of the ashtavakra gita series i think it was where gurudev mentions that god guru and self is the same when you come to a point when you discover that god is within you then there's no need for looking anything outwards everything is inwards so in fact i was just thinking i don't know i was talking to somebody and uh, they were saying that jaslene you should write a book i was like if i was to write a book the name of my book would be to journey within 
mm-hmm. that's what it would be no but what was your belief before how did that change i think now? my belief more was that i needed religion in my life i needed ritualistic practices in my life i don't need that anymore i feel all i need to do is just so you thought that god is something you seek outside outside exactly yeah okay that's not the case so that is one that's is one. there anything else which has changed apart from that anything else that's changed no not really mm-hmm. i still believe in hard work i still believe in a lot of determination i still believe in plan a only i just feel that it's very important to have a very strong relationship with yourself unless i me jasleen is not well taken care of and that's what my meditation does for me i meditate for about an hour in the morning and half an hour in the evening i would like to meditate longer in the evening but then the kids are at home and i'm not really able to do all that but all that just helps me have a better relationship with myself so where do you see yourself 10 20 years from now oh not 10 20 years my gosh vishal you should be asking me where should i see myself in 50 years okay. i plan to be around for 50 years teaching okay. me- meditation to kids and teaching math how much how beautiful it would be if i could not only take care of the brain but also the mind so you want to combine mathematics and meditation why not why not both are equally why important why don't you also throw in a little bit of nuclear physics and <laughs> all of that and figure out a way to like big these bombs which can be dropped and suddenly people start meditating after that so, that is exploded so nuclear physics will be a side effect of learning mathematics <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> Yeah. And you know maybe there could be some kind of a weapon where instead of it trying to destroy things it suddenly you have a blast and everybody's meditating. Huh. How cool will that, that be? That would be a wonderful bomb to The create. meditation bomb. <laughs> meditation bomb. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, no I I do see myself as being a meditation teacher, yoga teacher. So instead of WMD years. it becomes WMM, weapons of mass meditation. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> so you We can develop out. <laughs> So you can develop the WMM, the weapons right. of mass meditation. Meditation, right. And one of your formula is to combine that with mathematics. Yes. Yes. So how does mathematics and meditation combine? The brain and the mind. So how do they combine? Because isn't when you meditate you're not supposed to calculate? No, you're supposed to just sit and just do nothing actually. Yeah, because if you do nothing then how will mathematics happen? That is when you give rest to your mind that your brain becomes strong and you can learn a lot. So you don't do nothing, you just tell your brain that here is a mathematical equation and it will solve it itself. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that movie um on Nagarjun? Nagarjun. Yeah. What is that? the famous uh, famous physicist oh no i have not no okay you should see that movie uh huh yeah so a lot of this is through self understanding mm, yeah wow so uh if you were made the head of art of living <laughs> yeah shri right. shri comes and decides and says you know what just think you are the next guru <laughs> of art of living no thank you <laughs> no, i mean this is a hypothetical situation uh, what will you do what will be the three things you will change or improve i don't think i want to think about that hypothetical situation well, this is just a question, but yeah. um you never know i mean these things can happen if i you are the most qualified uh, shishya i guess <laughs> i don't i don't know well um three things that i would do i would i would do everything possible using every marketing technique possible to bring happiness program to every single person in america why america why not the rest of the world because oh well i live in america right okay, now okay. if i if i move to germany i would do that in germany okay so wherever okay. so yeah wherever i am yeah okay i would bring that um i would also bring the uh, kids program to every school possible in mm-hmm. america i think that's a very very important thing to do mm-hmm. and the third thing i would do is i would somehow make people understand and realize that this has got nothing to do with religion there's a lot of misconception about 
out of living and religion it's got nothing to do with well, religion not out of living i think in general people, in general, people think people of say. spirituality with religion yeah, right that's what yeah and i would i would really make sure that they understood that this this has nothing to do with religion this is just to take care of yourself and to empower yourself Mm that's amazing like you can you can literally empower yourself yes, through meditation. Yes absolutely. Yeah. Uh any books you recommend people now? So uh, one of my favorite book is uh, The Secret. Mm-hmm. I read that a long time ago. You were all about secret and top secret <laughs> and even your favorite <laughs> oh book is God, secret. I mean yeah. I wouldn't be surprised true. if you are actually a secret <laughs> agent sent into art of living from America <laughs> to understand what they are all doing. Ah uh, true mm-hmm. could be could be. No um the secret was a very very uh, impactful book for me because the message was so simple I could simple. have easily guessed it the best book is the secret okay. <laughs> No because the message was so simple my gosh it's so simple what you put out there is what you're going to attract that is So the secret is there is no secret <laughs> Yes there's no secret it's very simple Okay which is the other book apart from that I found the alchemist Mm-hmm. very very moving and very profound um one particular section where he talks about that the universe is constantly giving us signals we just have to listen to it mm-hmm. you know so i really found that very impactful three people in history you'd like to meet and what would you talk to them about three people yeah. that i'd like to meet in his- in history, from history from, from the history. past i would love to meet uh, mahatma gandhi I know it's a cliche I'm sorry. Okay. okay. I would love to meet Nelson Mandela. Okay. And Martin Luther King. Mhm. I've heard so much about them. I would really But like to know them. They were all similar them. people, right? That's I what know, they all say. I know. They were all weren't they all game changer? Aren't you a game changer? Mhm. You are a game changer, right? Yeah. You're an outlier. Yeah, that's what. Uh, weren't they an outlier? I mean they were outliers but okay so I'll take Mahatma Gandhi off my list how's that but Mahatma okay, so Gandhi inspired a... the other I know two. I know exactly exactly so so you um, could have just met Mahatma Gandhi and the other two would have no no because no because what Martin Luther King went through what he the wave that he created that was something to really be mm-hmm. you know in awe of so there's one more person who I would like to meet which is kind of silly again you're going to make fun of me but I'll admit it is Richard Feynman okay he was a very famous physicist okay yeah so like you would say okay fine you, you why didn't you say Einstein uh, like Richard Feynman is like the child of Einstein mm-hmm. you know like how Nelson Mandela got their inspirations from Mahatma Gandhi but but Richard, you won't want to meet Einstein um he's like the no I think Feynman. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. I mean, you can meet Feynman. Yeah. Uh another interesting thing I wanted to know that what would you like people to remember you as? Someone who never give up, gives up. Someone who is constantly moving towards her goal. And but isn't meditation about having no goals and isn't that whole thing about No, you know, I don't think there's anything no. wrong in having goals. Just like I don't think there's anything wrong in having ego. I think it's important to have ego, but big enough that you can put it in your pocket. Mm-hmm. You know. So when you are meditating, when you are giving rest to your mind, that's what you're doing in your meditation. You're giving rest to your mind. Mm-hmm. At that time you are doing nothing. Mm-hmm. You are nothing. And you so want nothing. If you only had 30 seconds to meditate, mm-hmm. how would you meditate? Just close my eyes for thirty seconds. Yeah, and like, do you think of some mantra or how do you? What do you do in thirty seconds? I could think of my mantra, but it'd be too short. Okay. Yeah. So thirty seconds is not good enough to. No, I don't think so. But if you, if thirty seconds is all you have to close your eyes and focus on nothing. Then go for it, my friend. You can. Okay. Yes, so you absolutely. You can meditate in as short as thirty seconds. Absolutely. Why not? Wow. So apart from Shri Shri, who are the other uh, gurus you look up to? Oh my gosh! What a question, Vishal. Why? What happened? I am like exclusive Shri Shri. तो नहीं हो सकता है ना? No, 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 no. Shri Shri is one of my living gurus. I my know, only sir. living guru. 
So but, who are your non-living gurus? Um, I I listen to a lot of Gurbani. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is the first guru. I'm I'm a Sardarni. Hmm. So I am Guru's child. I was hmm. born even before I was conceived. Hmm. I was I was surrounded by gurus. Hmm. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji all the way to Guru Gobind Singh Ji. I mean, their bani, their teachings have shaped me into the person that I am. Mm-hmm. So I do, and I call myself, I am Guru Gobind Singh Ji's daughter. Mm, wow. Yes. Wow. That's a good way of augmenting Shri Shri as your living guru and all the other gurus who are non-living gurus. But yeah, yeah. That's amazing. No, no, I mean, it's been really fascinating, this conversation with you, Shri. <laughs> yeah. And uh, like I said that, you know, your aspect of military to nuclear physics to blue light to secrets to now finding this blue light yes. uh, in the in the real world through meditation has been absolutely fascinating. I hope people listening have learned something out of it. I have for sure. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> looks like with the amount of things you're going to do in the next 50 years, we're going to get you back on the show very soon. Absolutely. Slow. I would love to be back. I would definitely. My next goal that I've set for myself for the next 50 years is to bring meditation to a billion children. Mm, wow. Yeah. That's a goal to really follow. Exactly. And 50 years actually is a little too long. You could probably do it earlier. Sooner. Right? Maybe in yeah. 20 years. Yeah. How's 20 that? years. That's a yeah. good one. Yeah. Anyway, so thanks a lot. And uh, looking forward to catching you soon. Yes. Bye. Bye. India's a massive subcontinent, home to truly stunning diversity. Behind the veils of smoke that obscure our thriving cities, our history is still alive, glimmering like sequins, waiting to be discovered. And if you, like me, are straining to hear the echoes of our past, this podcast is for you. I'm Anirudh Kanisetti, a history and geopolitics researcher, and I host Echoes of India, a history podcast about India, by Indians and for Indians. In Echoes, we journey through the complex histories of South Asia and what they can teach us about our globalized world. Tune in every Wednesday on ivmpodcast.com or your favorite podcast app. Hi, I'm Anupam Gupta, B50 on Twitter, and listen in to the Equity Sahya podcast brought to you by Mozilla Losfal Asset Management Company. The Equity Sahya podcast offers deep investment insights into the potential of many sectors in India which are growing and have a lot to offer for your portfolio. New episodes out every Tuesday on the IBM Podcast app or any other app where you get your podcasts from. <laughs>